Okay, great. Good, yes, well, thank you so much uh, for coming. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now as well. Um, and uh, in a few moments, I'm going to ask Chris if he would um, if he would open us um, just as we get we get started. Um, Chris, I'll let you introduce yourself, um, and uh, perhaps you'd uh, start us with uh, uh, by praying for us. It'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, David. Um, hi, everyone. Great to see you all here. Um, I do know a lot of you, but um, some of you are, are new names and faces to me. So I'm Chris Ray. I'm the chairman of the Board of Trustees of Irish Church Missions. Um, I guess on, on behalf of David and the staff and, and of the trustees, um, thank you all for, for coming, for making the time to be with us um, and to hear something about the plans for the building. Um, and of course, to ask any questions you have as well. So as David said, um, let's just pray for a moment as we begin, and then I'll, uh, I'll hand back to David and Carl to take us through the evening. So let's pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, we stand in awe of who you are, um, holy, majestic, wise, powerful, and unbelievingly um, loving and gracious to us. Um, to the likes of us, we praise you that you have made a way through Jesus completed work for us for all people to be forgiven of their sins and to have new life and hope in you. We thank you that the same good news of the gospel is going out in our day through your church and by the work of your Holy Spirit. For all of us on the call here this evening, for staff and trustees, of ICM for supporters and, and other interested people, we pray that you would use us as you see fit. We pray for the work of the gospel here in Ireland and we thank you for all the faithful churches here who are about your work. We ask that all of our plans and aspirations and all that we say and do here this evening would be pleasing to you and would be for the furtherance of your kingdom on this island. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, well, um, tonight uh, is an exciting night for us as we uh, continue to uh, roll out the plans for the redevelopment of our our building. Um, undoubtedly, some of you, if not all of you, have seen uh, the initial video, uh, which explains something of the vision, and you got a brief tour of the, the premises as well. Um, but tonight is really just an information evening. Uh, to to help you understand a little bit more behind the vision of what actually uh, the renovation will go towards. Uh, and then um, I'm going to explain a little bit more of that. And then uh, Carl, who has been our architect, we were just talking today, and I think it's been about two years he's been working in this project. Uh, he can explain a little bit more about that um, when it's his turn. Um, but... Uh, he will then walk us through uh, some of the proposed changes and uh, and then we'll end, as Chris has said, with some uh, comments, questions and, and perhaps a, uh, a brief time of prayer as well. But primarily tonight is really just um, more information and uh, and something of a consultation about what actually is uh, is envisaged with a project such as this. So let me begin by giving you um, something of the, the theological vision which underpins lies behind um, the renovation of our our premises. I'm going to run a little short video for you um, which talks about the uh, context of Ireland today and the need for for us all. It, it specifically um, highlights the needs for um, considerable um, financial donations but it's really a need for us all to think about how we use what God has given us uh, for the growth of his kingdom um, on this island. Uh, I'll jump back in after we've watched the video. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. 
not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Ireland, once one of the highest church attending nations in the world, wants today to forget the gospel and in exchange to bow down and worship other gods. While business may appear to be booming, in truth, we're facing a new famine. Irish Church Missions was founded 170 years ago with the help of gospel patrons who gave significant funds to help meet every need, but especially the spiritual need of the people of Ireland. Today, we're still seeking to answer this call, but now, just as was the case then, we need new gospel patrons who will prayerfully invest and significantly seed fund in new initiatives to sow the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ that alone can satisfy the hunger of every human heart. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. So um, that's what we're really all about in Irish Church Missions. It is about sowing the seed of the gospel, uh, which alone can satisfy the hunger of every human heart as it speaks to them about the Lord Jesus, um, who has died in their place and rose for their life and uh, intercedes for them now in heaven. That's what we're all about in Irish Church Missions. And that is where this building project fits in uh, to the grand scheme of things. Uh, as I said in the, the video um, with, the, uh, with the tour of the building, um, we see that within this uh, project there is potential for not only sustaining but growing future gospel ministry. So we have this premises in the city centre of Dublin um, and um, by, uh, by taking it to the next stage of its life, we hope that it can begin to uh, provide the seedbed uh, for funding for future uh, gospel churches as well. So really what we're about is building for the future of church planting in Ireland. That's essentially what we're talking about tonight. Um, so whilst we're talking about a building, please don't forget that it is about meeting a more serious need, and that is the gospel need that is in Ireland. Um, Irish Church Missions has a growing proven track record for being able to do that. So we are, by God's grace and by his, his mighty power, uh, being enabled to, to reach out into new communities and plant new churches. Um, but we recognise in Irish church missions that the need is greater than any one church or denomination can answer. Um, even if we were able to plant in our own lifetime 10, 20, even 50 churches, we would still need twice as many again. Uh, there is a great need in Ireland and no one church or no one denomination is actually ever going to be able to answer that need. But this is one small way in which we feel we can make a, a contribution uh, and we pray that it will be a significant one. If I can mix my metaphors and just change things up a little bit for you. Um, uh, we were thinking about the famine um, and uh, historically in Ireland, that is actually still a very um, poignant and, and live memory. However, there's another famous um, uh, Irish tragedy, uh, which I think is fitting for a discussion like tonight as well, and that is the Titanic and the sinking of the Titanic. Um, so if I can mix my metaphors and take you to the icy cold waters of the mid-Atlantic, uh, that's, I think, where we find ourselves as well. And I want you to think with me just for a moment, what actually um, could have prevented the appalling loss of life on that night? Let me just give you four things that went wrong. Firstly, there weren't enough lifeboats. We all know that. We may have watched the James Cameron movie. Um, 
I certainly have watched it more than once, um, but uh, there weren't enough lifeboats. And in a similar way, as you look at Ireland today, there aren't enough churches that are Bible centered and gospel driven. Um, we pray that uh, a project such as this will launch many more gospel gospel churches for Ireland. However, at the same time, perhaps another fault on that evening was the fact that the crew weren't properly trained actually to, to, um, to look after those who were in need. And in a similar way, uh, well, we all need training in evangelism. We all need to be better equipped. And again, we think that this project could be instrumental in raising up um, and training future leaders. Um, specifically, actually, especially if you watch the James Cameron movie, um, there was a, a real disregard for the poor. And it was uh, the case that it, on the upper decks, it was the, the rich who were able to get into the boats and and uh, be taken to safety. Uh, and then again, um, in, in any of our cities, particularly in Dublin, uh, there is a great need to to launch many churches with well-equipped leaders who particularly can can um, can reach out to those uh, in disadvantaged areas. That's a that's a, a part of our vision and, and one that we're seeking to try and cultivate by reaching out to Iranians at the moment already. However, and this is perhaps the most uh, uh, damning indictment on that fateful night, um, was the lack of compassion of the people who were already in the lifeboats. Uh, because I think it's well attested that many of the lifeboats were only half full. Instead of going towards the people who were screaming and dying in those icy cold waters, they sat at a distance removed. And only after the screaming had finished did they go back to pick up the dead. And again, as we think about it uh, in Ireland, particularly in Dublin, that is the case for many churches sitting on the fringes of society. Um, it's too scared to go back into those who are uh, perhaps um, lost, who are, um, who are dying in the, the sea of their sin, uh, because, well, it's going to be costly. And there may be even some hostile reactions, but uh, nonetheless, many churches are half full and they're unprepared to reach out. And that's simply not good enough. And so what we want to do with a with a project like this is to realize a vision of many churches uh, equipped with faithful leaders and compassionate people um, reaching out to the many different uh, levels of society here in Dublin and indeed Ireland. That's what we hope something a project uh, like this will begin to to realize. Um, and so it's. Uh, it's great that you have come along this evening. Um, like I said, this is the beginning of a conversation, but I think it's really important for you to know if you've got those two images in your mind, one of a famine um, and the need actually to, to sow um, the seed of the gospel and bring people to, to the life nourishing word of God as they see Jesus Christ, but also that idea of, of the great tragedy of the sinking of the Titanic and what could have prevented such a huge loss of life. We don't want to be found in our day to be ne neglecting either of those. So this this little project that we've got going, this little project, um, as Carl will tell you, it's uh, been two years um, under uh, uh, under his um, work at the minute. And um, we've got this city centre premises and um, the idea would be to renovate the entire premise itself so that it's a, a, a four story over basement premise. It would be to renovate the top three uh, floors, uh, which are currently offices uh, into apartments and um, then to bring those to market to enable uh, a source of income to be generated that would sustain future gospel ministry. But not only the, the top three floors, but also the ground floor and the basement because this in itself will become something of the um, the real interface with the city 
and the realization of the vision. So the, the ground floor would be uh, brought up to a, a sufficient spec that would allow church ministries to happen, but also for other events um, to occur as well, uh, which would give us a better connection with the city. And in the basement, which is currently um, lying dormant, um, we would uh, hope to put in, uh, as we see there, flexible space accommodating a lecture room, library, small teaching and uh, counselling rooms. We have, um, we've done a lot of uh, research uh, around uh, other possible uh, ways to realise this vision with a, a property in Dublin. We thought about selling, but really there doesn't seem to be anything else on the market that would offer us um, just as good an advantage as re, uh, refurbishing our present building. Let me, just as I bring things to a close, run through for you some of the, the pros and also the cons to doing a project like this. Um, the pros to developing, you can see them there, I'll, I'll run through them briefly, um, but it would encourage further church growth, we think. Um, that uh, would be a, a primary driver for uh, something like this, as I've said, fitting with the vision and would allow for future uh, church plants uh, by accommodating uh, a, a possible church planting academy. Um, at the same time as that, it would allow us to retain a fixed asset in the city centre and if done to a high enough spec, uh, would indeed uh, allow greater interface with the, with the city. Those are, those are the pros. Um, the cons, well, there are significant donations that would be needed in order to begin this and, and see it through to completion. We're very, very grateful uh, to God and uh, to, to a number of donors and trusts. Um, one specific donor has been incredibly generous and combined with uh, certain legacies that have been left, we already have been able to raise um, nearly 300,000 euros. Which is, which is a huge thing to be able to say, particularly in our day and age. Um, so we're, we're, we're very grateful for that, but of course there's still significant sums um, to, be, to be raised um, in addition to that. Um, the con also would be that uh, should we rely upon um, what we currently have, it would place too much of a strain on our current funding structures. And so we are, um, looking for outside donations um, in order to uh, to see the, the project through. Um, so uh, we're really grateful that you've you've joined this evening. Um, like I said, there will be opportunity for you to ask questions towards the end, if that's the case. Um, and uh, should you want more information, uh, I'll put this up at the, the end again as well, but should you like more information or want to make any sort of comments, um, then there's ways to get in touch with us, but probably the best way is to email dublin at irishchurchmissions.ie. Uh, uh, that's, that's my bit over for this evening, um, unless it comes to answering questions. Um, Carl, I'm going to hand over to you now. I'll stop sharing my screen um, and uh, let you uh, take over okay, from there. Thanks. Yeah. Carl, I should say, has been the architect. He has been working on this for the last two years, um, and we've had many conversations. He, uh, he is, um I don't know if you came up with this analogy, Carl, or whether I came up with it, but um, it feels as if it's a building. Having lived with it for the last two years, it feels as if it's a building. It's a bit like a Rubik's cube um, that fights back. <laughs> So we uh, have a, a great deal of debt um, uh, to uh, in, in Carl's favour and uh, for all the hard work he's done. Um, and uh, he has um, walked through the building, crawled through the building um, and uh, been all over the building many, many times. There we go. David. Yeah. Um, are you seeing my screen now? Yep. Yep. And everybody can hear okay? Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Um, yeah, thanks, David, and thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, yeah, I think my 
version of that recently was that uh, it was like a balloon that you you kind of push it one place to to progress the project and when you do that it just uh, pops out in another area um but um i mean this is uh, we're going to talk a lot about i suppose history and conservation this evening because of the context of this building but all of this is very much sustainable practice also because um the hard work is actually reusing buildings that you have um in ireland i think more so than other places we're very good at taking the easy option and either knocking things down or going and building a new which you know is not a not a good and sustainable practice so um i think we're we're doing it the right way um so hopefully you can see my screen um just to set the context um 28 bachelor's walk is a protected structure um which is the word we use in ireland um for something which is legally protected as a historic building of interest in england or northern ireland that might be a listed building so if you look that up on the list of buildings of interest um it's very simple it'll give a description of the building it will say it was built around 1881 and it'll describe what they see um we'll see that that's not quite true uh i suppose what i'm going to do is i i'm going to go through this in the order that we go through it as conservation architects and architects which essentially comes down to figuring out what we have um deciding what's important about it out of that deciding what we can do and then out of that come the proposals that are currently um before the local authority so um i suppose why i'm showing this is because uh protected structures in ireland they're given this status but um there isn't a detailed <clears throat> there isn't a detailed analysis done of each structure so the reason why there was a few structures on bachelor's walk protected is because uh a lot of it was knocked down there's very little uh, old buildings left on bachelor's walk and as it turns out the icm building is not as old as was taught at all in parts um so i'm just going to jump on now to our so the first question when we approach this it's it's a it's a complex building it's a big building and lots of different parts in it from different eras so we had to spend a lot of time figuring out what we have um the real value in doing that um it's very interesting but ultimately when we've gone in for planning application recently we have presented this in a way that we ourselves feel we're saying to the council and the conservation department that there's nothing to see here we know exactly what we're dealing with we're dealing with it very authoritatively we know the age of each part of the building and what is special about it and therefore we can have confidence in what we've said um because it's it's well analyzed you know and um hopefully that follows through so i'm just going to do a maybe a whistle stop tour of the history of the site um so uh yeah look i guess we're we're on bachelor's walk um very central in the current city um the buildings were built before 1700 as four-story townhouses um there's some interesting ads there for renting the house <clears throat> in those early days um uh, but this i guess this was a time before there was a bridge crossing at that point so you can imagine the the merchant ships and the, the trading ships um on the river immediately outside um the key wall being built um i'm sure it's written there around 1680 and then the development happening after that so it was the latest early in the city as the city moved towards the sea and then that became um even though they were houses first they became the center of all commerce um so the first um eras of the building's history are very much uh, merchants um and all kinds of you know there's a, a lot of um 
different wine merchants and lots of lots of interesting things there. I'm, I'm going to be jumping through this, um, but if anybody wants a copy of this afterwards, just do email me um, and we will share it and you can be looking at it in your own time. So you see an image there, uh, which is later. This is after the bridge was built, um, which kept the ships down past what is now O'Connell Street. And you see the houses just showing on the left. And they would have had steps up to them and four stories high there. Um, so we move on then. And the I think the most significant um, thing about this site is that it was the factory for a company called Boswell Paper Hangings Manufacturers for, for a long period of time. And that's probably the most interesting part of its history. Um, they were paper stainers, um, an old family in Dublin, and they are uh, the most significant paper stainers in Ireland. So this was their factory. Um, the part, we've, we've worked out that the part that was their actual uh, paper staining manufactory was called is the actual church space that still exists. Now, everything has been altered over time, but um, more or less the space that's there was their, their original factory from the early 1800s. Um, so that's um, one of the lads himself. You see an image there in the middle from 1850. Um, and number 28 is picked out there. So this, this might be an adaption of the first house or maybe, probably not a separate building, or maybe it was, it's hard to know. But you see there, um, at this point, they're using number 28. They actually um, had control over number 27, 28, and 29, or most of those. So they, they carved out a big factory site here in behind the front buildings and had a significant, they were exporting to, to London and um, Scotland and had a significant operation here. Um, we'll go on then and we'll see, uh, I suppose, this, this kind of research helps us to figure out what is left there and allows us to come up with the answers of what we're actually looking at in the building and therefore uh, stand over what we're doing and there's, you know, we can, we can justify that. So looking back at, uh, I suppose this is how wallpaper was manufactured at the time. It was all hand printed. Uh, there was no electrical lighting, so you needed and generous amounts of light to give accuracy in when the printer was putting down the, you see the, on the left there, he's holding a big, that's essentially a wooden stamping sheet. So that would have uh, the patterns on that and it's connected up to a bit of a hoist. He's laying that down, but each pattern uh, would have to be, would have a number of colors. So he has to line them up very, very carefully with each other, hence the, uh, generous natural light is needed and the guy beyond him um, is working at a clock there and he is preparing the paint that then this uh, kind of just overhead will be swung around the printing block will be dropped into the paint and then it'll be brought back to the table and the I suppose the artist who has responsibility for printing the actual paper um, lays it down in its correct position it's brought over then and it's hung over here to dry um, so it's, it's, it's likely that the main church space, as we see it at the moment, there's windows surviving on one side that, I, as I understand it, would probably have had windows both sides to have two rows, at least, of printers. And at that time was probably single story over basement. It was adapted later. Uh, you may well have had light from above as well. We don't know that. Um, so that's to give you, I suppose, a vision into, um, the world of that time, which in the obscure world of wallpaper history is quite important, <laughs> if that's important to anybody here. <laughs> um, I, there are books about this in, in Ireland. Um, so here are some examples of the kind of wallpaper that would have been printed there. Um, some of the later ones uh, survived because they were sent um, as patents to London. And this is James Boswell's signature here, James Boswell, Dublin. Um, I think I was to zoom in on that. Uh, I don't know. 
you know, I mean, that's 1842. So he's sending up this sample and then the other manufacturers can't copy it. So if I was to count there, there's a good number of colors in that wallpaper. Each of them, the block has to be laid down individually. So they have to be very accurate in where it lands. So all this wallpaper um, and many more with that for uh, a lot of decades was printed at number 28 and in uh, with various other buildings around it, in the yards around it. Um, so that is, um, that's kind of the, I suppose the most interesting legacy of the history of the site. Um, anybody that came for a long time after that considered themselves successors to Boswell because Boswell was so famous and well known and was kind of the, the top of his business. Um, the William Fry company came afterwards and continued on in the same business. Um, where are we looking at now? Okay, 1862 up until 1877. Um, I particularly enjoyed this ad here. Uh, a lot of our history in piecing things together. I mean, the, the history of these places doesn't, um, it's not accessible. You just have to put it together from snippets. Uh, a lot of that would come from newspaper um, ads and reports and directories. Um, I like this one here. Um, uh, these people would have been sending out people to big country houses and businesses to wallpaper and paint, you know. So um, wanted for a country job, a steady man. Um, might, I suppose that says more about the, the unsteady men of the time than the steady man. Uh, so we go on then, uh, 1877, and it changes then um, to a uh, furniture warehouses. Um, J. A. Byrne, he doesn't stay there for too long, 1877, only a few years. Uh, that seems a very short time, but I think that's right if I was to read that. Yeah, so um, he was doing business there and um, advertised some auctions and stuff at the end because he wanted to improve the building due to his amazing business. It turns out there was a, he was actually owing a lot of money and there was a court case. He was kicked out and then comes the next um, main stage of the site's history, uh, which is Thomas W. Begg. And that brings us, Thomas W. Begg brings us then right up to when ICM bought the building, they actually bought the building from w, uh, Thomas W. Begg and company. Uh, so we were, I suppose we're getting into the era then here that with photographs and stuff so we can see what the building was like. Uh, as we understand it is probably Thomas W. Begg that built this very nice building here. You can see it on the left uh, in 1915. Uh, this is, there's some lovely footage if anybody wants to check YouTube. If you do a search for Dublin 1915 high definition, you'll find this uh, restored footage and you can see the trams moving along here and the horses and people moving. It's, it's just a lovely snippet of trying to look at a bit of life in um, on the keys um, in 1915. So you'll see the building here is, uh, you might recognize the shop front is somewhat similar to what we have at the moment, um, but the rest is different. It's a three-story building. Uh, we now have a four-story building. Uh, and actually these buildings are all further out on the key than our current alignment. Uh, there was always an ambition to keep moving things back as traffic was introduced and more space was needed. Uh, so, yes, we will go on from that then. So you'll see, this is where it gets interesting. Um, so look, I suppose then we, by getting all our information together, we start to figure this out. You'll remember in the beginning, the building was protected, thinking it was an 1881 building. You'll see here, we're at 1920 and we have a completely different building which doesn't exist anymore. Um, and if we zoom in on that, uh, the shop front here is, you can recognize it as kind of the current shop front, but if you look at the proportions, you'll see the people standing here, that's a man's head, and you'll see the top of the column there is a full person's height above his head. At the moment, the top of those columns is just above your head when you're standing in the street. Um, if you look at the top of the shop front, it's, be, it's above halfways in the second story of the next door building. So this is a really beautiful high uh, 
uh, elaborate shop front and the whole front of the building is um you can only imagine we don't know what the inside was like but it must have been an amazing building so the outcome of all of that is we recognize the shop front but it has been chopped down and reused on our current building um hence i guess we could allow some confusion in the data of the building. Well, if I move on from that, then uh, there was a, I guess there was a push, literally to push the fees back. This is just some Thomas W. Begg ads. They were wine merchants um, and various alcoholic merchants, tea also and coffee when it came in. Um, quite interesting ads in the newspapers and stuff when they started selling Buckfast tonic wine. Um, very interesting, the claims that it was made. There's even ads there with pictures of nurses and all of that. Uh, very, I guess, funny from in today's context. Um, there was actually a Buckfast sign on the front of the building for lit up for some period of time. Uh, we move on then, various pictures here, which are all during the Beg era. Um, but yes, we're jumping into the current building now, um, which we have dated to be 1936. Um, there was a policy at the time of widening the keys, so perhaps um, Thomas W. Begg needed an extra floor and went with the policy, built this new building in 1936. You'll see there's just two flagpoles on the top of it. Um, originally, um, the other buildings were not set back for a long time. And this is the shop front then, which a lot of reused material because it was a very high quality shop front from 1881. Um, beautiful materials and very lovely craft in it. Uh, so he wanted four stories. He had to chop it and reuse it. So it's that's what we end up with nowadays. Uh, an 1881 shop front and a 1936 building above that. Uh, we go on from that then. Uh, some that's uh, an image there with Irish Church Missions lettering up there. So that is uh, Irish Church Missions bought in 1968, and the lettering went up fairly soon after that. Uh, I don't, I won't go through the brief history of Irish Church Missions. I'm sure there's various people listening that know it a lot better than I do. Um, so then, I guess the building has been well used and kind of stood alone. It's kind of a lot of bachelors walk during the late 80s and 90s actually became a battleground for what was going to happen in the center of the city. Um, a huge amount of it, there was 43 properties between bachelors walk and the laneways behind it bought by one company with the hope of building a big shopping center. There was earlier talk of a big um, transport hub with buses and stuff. There was even talk at some periods of a flyover going over the Liffey. So, um, and it was also, I suppose, a battleground for people trying to start some uh, law for protecting historic buildings. Um, but at the same time, they were being assisted to fall down. So, uh, number 28 has seen a lot to see it there standing alone um, with everything else falling around it. And I guess the reason for that is, um, this in 1936 was a robust new concrete structure. So this is a solid, fairly modern building in the context of the earlier stuff that was around it. Um, so a modern image there. So that's kind of a, a very fast view of where we've come from. Um, we just have some, <clears throat> some maps here. Uh, the first map there is 1756. So you'll see lots of ships uh, in the cage in the river. There's no bridge. Um, there at that stage. Um, then uh, there's various changes with O'Connell Street and stuff later, which makes this a very um, strategic position in the city. It's really at the hub of business that's happening. The first Ordnance Survey map, we can we can see that a lot of the middle of the, the sites, which would have been gardens originally, are filled in. And the main block in the middle of number 28, we understand to be the the printing area for the wallpaper, um, which would originally have had light to both sides and various other uh, darker uh, facilities around that storage and lots of other things. Um, we can kind of put this together from valuation records, um, size of buildings in the 1850s when they were valued 
the age of the buildings at that, that time and the descriptions and <clears throat> sorry, by lining that up with maps, we can make certain judgments. <clears throat> There's uh, various changes there to later maps and <clears throat> the last image there <clears throat> shows uh, 1976 and uh, the interesting thing there is that at that time, I guess there was a lot of pressure with traffic and uh, the, the, the city was really dominated by traffic and uh, limited by road width. So there's actually a widening line shown here. So there was even at that point an ambition to actually push the buildings back further. And that widening line goes right through the stairs of our current building. So we're actually lucky that the current building survives and it didn't have to be rebuilt again. Um, these are very interesting maps, um, which were done for fire insurance purposes. So these give us great detail about the layout within the building at various times. And if you go back to the 1890s, um, you can see in the main space in here, you can see the windows that align with the modern current windows. And um, with some analysis, we can, we can recognize a lot of our current remains of the back part of the building in this. So I guess that brings us to the question. And the reason why we do this is we need to see what we have. Um, so I'll just jump ahead and I suppose the easy way of presenting this is a question of what we have as regards built fabric is what we call it. Um, we have, Carl, yes. Carl, can I just, can I just interrupt? Um, no, I did promise people that we would be done within under the hour. Perfect, yeah. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to fast forward if, if you can. That's fine, I'll, I'll fly through this so we'll get onto the plan instead. <laughs> okay, so briefly, we have to figure out what we have, and this is important um, because this is what we're dealing with. We have the front building, which was in 1936, very robust and not very decorative, but very solid and nice building that's actually very useful for us. We have an 1881 interesting shop front. We have underground, a bit of basement that's from a much older building, which is not significant because it's not very usable. And at the back, we have uh, about early 1800s uh, Boswell wallpaper factory, and that is older structure, but much adapted. So we don't have to be very delicate with it. So we kind of appraise what we have. We look at what the significance of that is, and then everything is broken down into what we have, what we're going to change, and how we justify that. Um, and that's all laid out for the council then to see. Um, it's laid out in tabular form because the building's quite good. So I suppose, look, we know exactly what we have then. I will jump into our plans, which are here, our drawings. Um, and I'll just go briefly to what we are doing. I, I guess, look, we're adapting, we're not doing zero, which is about in relation. Carl, I think we're losing you. Um... Basic sanitary facilities. Um, CM to fund the building. So uh, what I will do is I'll jump to the proposed drawings. Um, I can find them. It might be, uh, apologies, it might be, it's a, a solid, so it's hard sometimes to read this. I'll, I'll just go through the, the basement briefly. At the moment, the basement is, is unused, and that's a huge resource because of the actual size of it right in the middle of the city. Um, by sorting out access and egress and fire issues, um, there's a huge amount of potential there. So, meeting room beyond that, we have a library and meeting room as well. And in the back, we're putting in the basic facilities of toilets that we need. We're putting in a stairs at the back of the existing church space to just link everything and allow. Um, escape and circulation in different directions. A lot of the trickery of what we've been up to and trying to figure stuff out is actually getting eggs. 
lots of in Forest Start about how to make a, an old building work in relative to modern um, demands. And so um, then the ground floor, um, you're coming into the existing front lobby. Um, you're turning right as you do into the front space of the building. You need to put in another glazed lobby then, which is uh, for fire purposes. The front of the building then, I'll show you some images in a minute that might be more helpful. We're putting in a ramp there because there's a change of level and we're designing that in a way that it's also an informal uh, meeting space, gathering space, and also potential use for Sunday school uh, gatherings like that or prayer meetings or whatever the use might be. Um, we're existing bathroom that's there so that is a fully wheelchair um, the rear space it's de is there we're ex uh, making the most of it i guess and uh, putting in a screen to one side that kind of curves around um, so that you can hide services and chairs and storage behind that um, so we're, we're adapting rather than there's no huge change and it's well lit at one side, so it is nice. We're opening up the kitchen at the end to work better, and we have to get an exit out and a stairs in at the back. Um, beyond that, there's another multi-purpose room being carved out at the back. To do that, we're diverting the current circulation route. All of this looks very easy here on paper, but that means going through existing light wells and various uh, structural gymnastics to make that happen. But it, it frees up space for that we can use in the, which is a challenge at the moment is you're going through spaces and stuff that just uh, nullifies them. Then we go upstairs and I guess the easiest way to describe that is that, um, you know, there's potential there for floor and the two new apartments on the first and second floor. I see them to as being very attractive open plan apartments um, in a very solid building with a lovely view over the river in the middle of the city. So um, they will be very nice. All the original windows and stuff are in the building, all will be restored. So it's actually very exciting and um, there will be huge potential there and I, I would guess much sought after. Um, the rest are sections and stuff. So um, I hope I'm not skipping too fast, but if I just show you some images might be clearer. So this is just a kind of a mock-up of the main church space. You're looking back out towards the street. Um, these spaces will always look small on uh, on images on screen. It's it's not a very wide space, but it works and it will work. And I guess what we've done there with the screen on the left is hide a lot of mess, for want of a better word, behind that, um, so that the space can feel uncluttered and tidy. Um, you'll see that it's nicely opened up to the front to create a connection out to the front space. Um, we'll make the most of the existing light and there's an existing uh, skylight as well that is quite important. Um, so going out to the street and looking back in, this is inside your lobby. Now this is an earlier image so this has changed a bit but it'll give you the general idea of kind of a communal space at the front and you see into the church space at the back. Um, the steps will be still there but what we've done now is where this guy is sitting in the corner. Um, you actually walk in there and the ramp is behind the screen and pops out up here on the top level. So um, that's changed, but the it's not hugely different. Um, I will, there's just one or two images here which aren't quite as worked up of that. I'll just find a suitable one. So you see there, there's a lobby at the front. You're going in behind and going up by the pink wall. Um, and coming out here. So the ramp is kind of subtle and hidden. It allows the main room to be used as a, a multi-purpose space. Um, so I hope that gives a little, obviously we'll have questions and do ask um, anything you want and I can send on any information to anybody that is interested in looking at it in more detail. Um, I mean, in summary, I suppose, I would, this, this is a, a very good building. Um, and like I say, the project is about sustainability and adaption to just bring it up to date and make it work for ICM's current and future plans. And the, the bottom line here is the building has a huge amount to give. 
it's a, a tricky and complicated building with the basements and basements on the basements and a huge amount of services. Um, you know, it just takes work to figure that stuff out and get it to work with current regulations, but it's done and we're there and, you know, that's good work and um, it's, it's going to be great and I look forward to some of the lovely spaces that we're going to have uh, freed up in the basement, especially, you know, it would be lovely to just make that work again, you know, along with the, the spaces that are already used on the ground floor, you know. Um, I guess the way I see it is that the building is holding back its current uses and it's it's just at the point that um, it's shouting for a bit of help. Um, so hopefully we can do that. Cara, thanks very much. Um, if you want to stop screen share, yeah, then uh, everybody can come back on. Um, like Carl said, if there are any questions you want to ask, um, then please do. Uh, it's, uh, it has been um, a something of a labour of love, perhaps, for Carl, as, uh, as he's um, dealt with a building that is heavily restricted in terms of um, the regulations. Um, so we are very, very grateful and, and thankful for all the, the detailed work that he has done. Um, and uh, I should say the stage that we're at at the minute is that our our planning application has been submitted. Um, uh, so that's with Dublin Council, City Council, they'll be reviewing that. They will be back to Carl with undoubtedly questions and points of clarification. Um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Carl, but you're you're suggesting that it's going to take at least four five possibly even six months uh, before the planning application is actually granted uh, yeah it'll be two months before questions and then we'll have to deal with the questions and there'll be another five weeks so you're looking at four months david you know we would expect um we would expect some detailed questions you know maybe about how we're approaching um i suppose look in these buildings um You'll see a lot of detail work there that I went through about the history and stuff. But the reason why we've laid that all out is to so that we actually can be authoritative and that we'll get to go ahead on the little bit of uh, I won't call it destruction, the little bit of adaption that we need. And that mostly happens in the basement. We need to get some stuff out of there that is old um, sure. to allow stuff to happen. So that's the crux of this, you know. So sure. yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, guys, uh, time is marching on, um, but um, and you've heard a lot tonight, uh, maybe uh, an overload, but if there are any questions that spring to mind, um, then please do knock yourself off mute and, uh, and ask away, either for the vision that lies behind it or the actual um, architectural changes that, uh, that are going on. David, um, just about, um, is no offices going to be in the building anymore? Where do you see them being or are you outsourcing them somewhere else? Um, I'll answer this and then let Carl correct me, will I? Um, so, uh, so if you uh, can remember down to the back of the main hall where the church meets there's an exit um it takes you out and there's um there's a space that currently is redundant at the moment uh it's actually the the fire escape that that fire escape is being adjusted uh to allow for at least one office to be put in there um, but also in the, in the basement there will be um space set aside for for offices as well um as uh, as they're required so yeah we're we're taking the offices out of the the top three floors um uh, as well as the library and putting putting them in the basement and and towards the back of the building and uh, interesting and um, i just didn't catch carl and i'll just say thank to him for all the work it's very detailed very interesting uh to be in such a historic building and the fact that it's been moved back two meters from the original is very interesting um, but the, the old safe, uh, people who know ICM will know the safe, uh, I take it, it's, I didn't quite catch what Carl said, but it's staying, I think it's too too expensive to remove it. Uh, yes, is, is that Hazel speaking? 
Yes, yeah. yeah, yes, Hazel. Um, I I didn't go into that detail, but they, there's nothing happening the safe. Um, and you are right; it's pretty solid, and uh, let's not go messing with it, you know. <laughs> and I think David enjoys holding the key of it anyway, so uh, <laughs> we'll just leave it alone. Well, it's good to know it's a lot of historical documents in that safe. <laughs> David, what about uh, carbon neutrality, meeting carbon climate targets in relation to heating and all that sort of stuff? Thank you, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I guess the it's it's early days as regards um, how we will deal with heating and that. Um, it, it has to be relatively simple, but I guess what I need to say is that uh, the most sustainable building is the building that's already built. And as we go through it in detailed design, we will work um, in whatever way we can. Um, there isn't huge challenges here. This thing that's really completely surrounded, there won't be a huge heating load. Um, so we, we'll do the best we can in all of that. Um, but the big picture here is that we are putting in the hard work in freeing up space that, you know, has become, it's like a jungle in the basement with services that, you know, build up over years. And the easy option is to avoid these spaces. The, the right thing to do is get stuck in hard work, figure it out and free up that space um, rather than building a new, you know, and leaving valuable space unused in where we need it, you know, so. Um, I, I hope I'm not avoiding your your question there, um, but we're very aware of uh, of carbon and all of that conversation, which is very fashionable and current. I uh, I suppose I I'm I'd throw my tuppence worth in as well because it's a restricted building. It goes down even down to the windows and the um, the frames of the windows. Um, so uh, you know we would be required to. Um, rather than replace those, we're we're going to have to bring those up to sufficient um, quality again. Uh, so it's not a case. There there are historic iron iron pipes as well, which, uh, as far as I understand, need to be kept. It's a very, it's a significant building in terms of the historic interest, as you've seen. Um, and so that's the that's the um, the difficulty of being. Uh, contemporary and and uh, keeping up to step with carbon neutrality and stuff while, whilst at the same time honoring the past I think that's one of the challenges that Carl has been has been dealing with yeah you're right David but I would say in all of that um, it, it's it won't be difficult here you know and, and already on the top floor secondary phasing and We uh, we continue to lose um, Carl. You know, it's... Okay, Carl, we we just lost you there, but I was just going to comment that it's your optimism, um, where you keep on saying, "Yeah, anything's possible," um, <laughs> which has uh, which has kept us going yeah. <laughs> through the last two years. Yeah, anything else? We've just gone past nine. Um, uh, keep a nice clean wall so we can put some more Boswell wallpaper up on it. <laughs> <laughs> would be nice. <laughs> would you attract it to any particular pattern, Kieran? <laughs> um, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna call a halt to proceedings. Um, uh, I really do appreciate your time, and I know for some of you, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the it's the afternoon, it's the middle of your day, um, and um, you have plenty of other things to be getting on with. Um, others uh, need to be heading to bed. Um, Chris, I'm just going to ask you to close in prayer, if you wouldn't mind. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. There's Daniel. Sorry. Hi, Daniel. How you doing? Hi, you big man. Sorry. Just uh, <laughs> we got we got baby bombed here. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Let's pray, um, shall we, everyone? Yeah, let's pray. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Our great God, we thank you for this time together this evening. We um, thank you 
as well for everyone who was able to make the time to come and hear about our plans. Um, and we, we pray again for the work of ICM and for the churches that we care for um, and for all of those that we encounter who, um, who don't know you or call on Jesus as Lord and Saviour. We pray that you would help us to hold out the good news of the gospel. And we pray that all of the plans that we've discussed this evening um, would be fit to support and propel that work. We ask that you would go with all of us into tomorrow, into the weekend that lies in front of us as well. Keep us walking with you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, so guys, um, thank you so much. Like I said, if you want to um, make any further comments from what you've heard or um, if you want to get in contact, then um, you may want to take a screenshot of that uh, on your phone or uh, you can find that on our website, irishchurchmissions.ie, um, and find out how to get in contact with us there. But otherwise, thank you so much. Like I said, this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, we will keep um, you up to date should you wish to be kept informed and um, appreciate your time this evening. Thank you very much. Great to see everyone. Okay. Thanks, David. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Bye.